All right, let's give it up for Tim. Oh. I didn't even start yet. Um, so save your applause. <laughs> you can tell me if it's worth it. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, from Jamstack to Jamhack, what makes it so secure. Uh, this talk was inspired by the fact that you know we, we go online to pretty much any Jamstack sort of pitch site or anything like this, and it says, oh, it's fast, it's reliable, it's, it's easy, and it's secure. Um, but no one really challenges that from what I've seen. They talk about how quick the build tools are. They, they talk about how easy it is to get started on your system with a React app or a Hugo app or, or anything in between. Um, they really like to sort of focus on their own products like Netlify, but they kind of over sort of overstep the security piece. And I just wanted to take this presentation opportunity to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the web security challenges that we might face um, with the Jamstack and then also talk a bit about which ones might apply to the Jamstack or not. Uh, and finally, some ways you, uh, you as a developer can start thinking about security within the context of your own Jamstack sites. Um, this is intended to be somewhat language agnostic uh, and focus more on just thinking about security in the context of your web application. So if you have any questions, or I think this is a pretty small group, so don't hesitate to stop me during uh, if you have any thoughts or just you're confused about something that I've got up on screen. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it off with a brief demonstration. Um, we've all probably built something like a, um, a you know, a, a Jamstack application before, in, in especially in languages like React. Uh, so today, I'm going to walk through a very simple uh, React JS uh, application, and and you'll see why in a minute. So we're, we're used to going in with a command like npx and do create React app. Um, and here I'm doing a, using the create React app template to create a React JS application with the name Jamhack. Uh, once I run this command, I'll be able to change into the directory Jamhack where I actually have my application source. And then use npm to run the npm start script and build my React JS application from the create React app uh, template. So you go in, you might see it start and build, and then ideally I'll see this message compiled successfully, and I'll have a nice live demo set up on my screen, which looks something like this when you uh, use the create React app template. So this is great and all, and you know we'll pretend that I'm really new to uh, React JS, and this is a pretty common format you might see for a React JS tutorial. Uh, so I go in and I say, okay, well this is nice. I, I see that learn React button. What if I want to go in and make that a little nicer? Uh, at that point, I might go in and Google search for something like cool React NPM packages, try to make my, you know, React.js application look a little snazzier. You know, I've, I've heard about this NPM thing. I'm basically Node.js expert now. So I'm going to go in and I see, oh, Re React awesome button. That looks perfect for what I might want to add to my React.js application. Cool. You know, obviously this is going to be a Jamstack focused application. And I, so I'm all focused on building this quickly and effectively and bringing in all the great things that the community has, the, has to offer. So I go in and I go ahead and do npm install react awesome button. Great, it's that easy, right? I'll go in, run the command, we'll see some stuff spit on the terminal, and then eventually I get this message, oh cool, added 290 packages from 120 contributors, um, updated 1,360 packages, and audited quite a few more. And with that, found zero vulnerabilities. Oh. Okay, I'm totally good. This is good. I, I found this app, this sweet package. I put it in. Look, no vulnerabilities, you know? I, me as a developer, I'm a little confused. All right, well, I added 290 packages with one command. I, I don't really know how that happened, but I'm not going to worry about it. I got a cool button out of it. So I open up Visual Studio Code, and I add my awesome button. I, I did this ahead of time. Live demos are too risky for my first talk. <laughs> and uh, I added, so added my awesome button here. It's going to look great. Learn React. Cool, I go back to my demo and, and voila, I've got my nice learn react button right here. It's great, you know, better than some lame like hypertext link, whatever, you know. So I publish this up, let's say I put it on Netlify or some other hosting platform for Jamstack applications and I hit the button. All right, well, what's going on here? The, the site ahead contains malware. How did this happen? I, I had a link to a nice learn react tutorial I just installed a cool button and now I've got this. Site ahead contains malware. And my users, they might even be seeing this at this point unless I stop it and take it down. Why, why did this happen? What happened? We, we created a pure React app with one additional package from NPM. This package obviously contained some malicious code or had a dependency containing malicious code. And what I thought was a cool button package was really a malicious payload. 
taking that angle, you might think, all right, well, you, I mean, Tim, you, you did just select like the first thing off of Google search. And even then, I do know that that is a reputable uh, NPM package. So what, what are you getting at here? Um, and what I'm getting at is that this is a real thing that happens. This example is, is something uh, from a pretty popular article on Medium and HackerNoon.com, which is a great resource if you're interested in maybe crossing the boundary from design and development into some security related topics. Um, and here, this author talks, you know, saying, I'm harvesting credit card numbers and passwords from your site. Here's how. And this author actually walks through how he might put together a malicious NPM package or, you know, software module and then have you inadvertently install it to your site without you or the rest of the community knowing. And he says at the end of this article that this is fiction. It didn't really happen, but this is for his article. What you also see in the news is things like, Microsoft spots malicious NPM package stealing data from Unix systems, a real thing that happened. Uh, NPM pulls malicious package that stole login passwords, a real thing that happened. Uh, even uh, this get cookies module, it comes in and actually installs a backdoor on your site. Uh, and you even see this outside of just NPM, which is kind of what I use for this demo here in things like Ruby gems. Uh, so current events say that this is something that happens and it's something for you to be aware of as a developer for the Jamstack as you two go in and use so many of these community developed tools to build a you know, strong, cool, fast, secure web application. Um, that's just one case study for security on the Jamstack, but I, I hope that it kind of provides a nice expose into, okay, well, sure, if, if there's some sort of vulnerability there, how might I look at addressing that on my application? Um, so from there, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the difference between a static and a dynamic site, which really makes a difference between a traditional site or application and a Jamstack site or application. Um, and then I'll highlight some of the vulnerabilities that are common to both kinds of web applications and why the Jamstack can be more secure sometimes, but only with the right knowledge and the right configuration settings and so forth. Um, do, do folks have any questions or anything going this far? Cool. Okay, I'll keep going. So, just a yes. Um, well, so I'll get to that in some of the resolution steps, but a lot of the times, no. If someone hasn't seen something like that before, like in this case, I went to a malicious link, so something like Google Chrome would be able to just pick up on that. So, okay, I already know this is a bad link. Let me tell the user. But if uh, something, let's say I have a worse vulnerability, like something that lives in my web browser and is stealing my passwords, if no one's identified that and reported it, um, it could very well not be present like that, which is why we have some other options for looking at how you would find out, oh, okay, I've got this vulnerability or I don't have this vulnerability. Um, so, did you have a question? Well, I have a, yeah, sorry, were you done? No, no, keep going. Um, so, and I don't want to jump ahead too much if you're probably gonna get to some of this stuff, but like, <clears throat> there's there's so much like, like interlocking dependencies I noticed today. So like, something like Create React app, if you install that, you have like, it's hundreds. Like hundreds. It's, it's of hundreds packages. of packages. Have like sub packages and things like that. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like dependency hell a lot of the time, but it, it's hard because we're we're taught not to reinvent the wheel and like write everything from scratch. So like, and I'm sure you're gonna get into this stuff. But like, how do we, on the one hand, not write everything from scratch, but also keep things slim and and within our understanding? Because I feel like it's so far out of our grasp of understanding when you have hundreds and hundreds of packages that. From all over. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you know we rely a lot on trust. Like, oh, people who maintain this are probably nice and smart, and I don't have to worry. But like, how do you get some of that peace of mind? So it's it it goes like that's the whole inspiration for this talk is what you'll find by the end of it is that Jamstack isn't any less secure than another web application, but it's also not as it, it's not any more secure than any other web application either. Um, and that's and a lot of that comes with this sort of trust idea that we have to accept when it comes to using this sort of third party open source community code. Um, there are ways to safeguard like, OK, say I, I bring in some third party code that's rogue or again, if I want to be on the lookout, it's you're not like a bad person, I guess. If, if you install some package um, through NPM and it turns out to be a malicious package, chances are the, you're not the target, it's some corporate, you know, or unless you are the corporation, then sorry. But if it's some corporate <laughs> application or something, and they go, oh, man, like we found that this vulnerability is in the source, they'll report it up through NPM and then push updates and let users know. A lot of it is, is a trust thing just like, you know, I'm, I just opened my slides on your laptop. I mean, you, I hope you trust me, but like it's, 
it sort of falls into that that aspect of security where it all boils down to trust. But I, ideally, by um, you know having sort of a, a judicial kind of mindset and then also having some security elements in play on your site, you, you should be okay. But I'll get more into that, just like you were saying. Any other thoughts before I keep going? Cool. Okay, so just to highlight again, folks here are probably familiar with the Jamstack, but if not, uh, I just want to abstract it a bit to two different kinds of websites. Um, what we're using now for a Jamstack-based website and, and something else that you know folks may have seen early in the days of web development is a static site. A static site is just a combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You know, JavaScript APIs and markup. It's it's the Jamstack. It's always stored as a collection of files on a web server, and when you as a user go to request these files through something called an HTTP request, the server says, all right, I've got these files, here you go. That's it, there's no other, from the high level, there's no other intermediate steps. You get the files that you ask for and your browser handles the rest. Uh, what came before the Jamstack, well, I, I shouldn't say before, what existed more prominently before folks really jumped on the Jamstack um, is what you might see a lot in like WordPress-based site and other CMS-based sites with a backend server. Um, is the dynamic site. A dynamic site similar to a static site because it, it still uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but every time I request what I think is gonna be those resources from the server, the server is actually generating these resources to be returned back to me. Um, and this is through different server-side scripting technologies. So you know, I've got a few listed up there, but one folks are really familiar with is PHP. If you go out to a, a WordPress-based site, when I get my page back, maybe it's Tim's coffee blog. If I go to Tim's coffee blog and request the index.html, the main page, what I'm really getting back is what the server is saying, okay, go in, uh, get all the posts from this database, and then make sure you get the comments from this table, and then also go ahead and bring in this uh, chatbot tool. Yeah, grab that from our resources, package it all together, and then return it to the browser that your user requested it from uh, in the form of that you know, package of HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, and, and so that's really just the key difference to keep in mind is that there is, is all these additional steps involved in giving you the resources that you as a Jamstack developer are used to just building into a package, sticking it on a web server, and, and you're good to go. Or it might be part of your CI, CD, your development pipeline or things like that. Um, so with that being said, uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we're used to finding in a dynamic site are found in these additional steps um, in a dynamic site. So here I've, I'm sort of depicting what you have as, a, um, as the, the scripting software running on your web server, your database running on your web server, um, and then any, anything else that you have on your web server that is designed to sort of hand off these um, package of files when you request it from, the, from a website. So that's hopefully, hopefully not too deep of a description, but also high enough that you guys kind of get a sense of where I'm coming at from this, or where, where I'm coming from on this. Uh, so that being said, I like to think of it um, between the Jamstack and static sites versus dynamic sites as two different kinds of locked buildings. On the left, you see a sort of a bank vault with one door, well locked, but just one door in, one door out, and then you have a house with many windows, many doors, many points of entry, um, and I think it's safe to say that this is how you can consider security with the Jamstack. On the left, you have your static site or your Jamstack-based site. On the right, you have your uh, dynamic site or your more classical WordPress-style site, etc. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if I were an attacker coming to, to take advantage of you know, my house on the left with this bank vault, large, single lock door, or my house on the right with the many windows and many doors, I have one point of entry versus many. Uh, and what this boils down to is a concept called the attack surface. So uh, from, a, from an organization that I'll specify in a minute, the, the definition of your attack surface when it comes to your web application and security as a whole is all the different points where an attacker could get into the system and get data out or exfiltrate data from your server, from your site, et cetera. Um, and the reason that folks more often than not, say the Jamstack is, is more, most secure is because that attack surface is greatly reduced. Uh, thinking about, again, the difference between a dynamic site and a static site, you have just the content server that hands out the files versus the dynamic site. There's so many pieces of the puzzle that can be touched as you go through um, and, and interact with a website. 
So thinking about that, thinking about the attack surface, um, I would like to tell you about the OWASP Foundation. Uh, the OWASP Foundation is the Open Web Application Security Project. This is a, a nonprofit group that cares a lot about web application security and actually issues a sort of charter of the top 10 web application vulnerabilities. And then this sort of charter document guidance piece, if you will, is based on um, what the industry says about web application vulnerabilities, based on what users and the community saying about web app vulnerabilities. Uh, and hopefully by highlighting these uh, sort of top 10 vulnerabilities, this organization wants to you know, bring, just like, sort of like what I'm doing today, bring your awareness to security vulnerabilities in the applications that you build, specifically as a developer or as somebody working closely with a development team uh, for your site or application. So I, I highly encourage you after the talk to check out some of their resources. Um, they have a lot of tutorials, software, guides, and things like that for getting more into web app security. Um, it's where I learned a lot of things that I'm able to kind of share now, and I hope that uh, I hope that you're able to take a look at that. But continuing right along to the OWASP top 10, which is where I'll frame sort of the next piece of this talk, um, I'll walk through some of the vulnerabilities on this list and why they're present in more classical web applications and why we don't find them in the Jamstack, but how they can still impact your work on the Jamstack. Um, do you folks have any questions before I, I go on to kind of the next part of this? All right. I'll, I'll, oh, yeah, what's up? Right. Uh, so there are many servers. Wouldn't that make it so there are many entry points? So the way, so the way I think of it is, is um, so you're used to the Jamstack being framed in the context of a of a CDN or a content distribution network, yeah, where you, CDN. you know, I push to Netlify, and then my code lives on six different racks across the country, so that maybe if one goes down or if one's going to be faster, those resources will be returned to me um, at the optimal speed. In this metaphor, if you will, of this single door, we have to assume that no matter which server I get my code from, it's the same code or the same door, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, exactly, because they're all the same house. When you push to Netlify, you know, within seconds, all of your all of your servers are going to have the same copy of your code, whether it's the same vulnerable code or not. Um, so, it, does that help kind of clarify? Okay, cool. Please. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious if so. There's like the edge servers with the CDN, right? Where there's multiple servers with the same door, but there could be the case, and I think you would know a lot more than I would in this. But like when you have lots of microservices that are using many backend services, that I assume that increases your attack vector in some sort. Of absolutely, way. absolutely. So it's it's fascinating to tackle Jamstack from a security perspective because. I mean, Jamstack is cool, but how many Jamstack applications do you have that are just fully self-contained? That it's just, here's, you know, my picture about me, how to get in touch with me. Jamstack applications are founded on the idea that you can quickly and, easy engage, quickly and easily engage with microservices, engage with APIs, um, and sort of just hook into all these different third-party services to really build out your site or application. So that's a great point. That, it, that, that is exactly right, that it does increase the attack surface. Um, so moving right along with the OWASP top 10, uh, I'll talk about what these top 10 vulnerabilities are. Um, and and some of these you may have heard in the news or seen when you're kind of clicking around doing your work. So hopefully this is not completely new, but if it is, awesome. I, I tried to frame these pretty, pretty high up from a very non-technical perspective just because I don't want to assume what background folks are coming from. But I hope that this helps you sort of maybe get a stronger sense of what security looks like um, from a web perspective. So the nice thing about Jamstack um, is one thing that a lot of people are going to say is you technically don't have any database vulnerabilities because you, you don't have a database. Naturally, you think right away, OK, well, I do hook in with a third-party API that provides me my users and my database, so I do have a database. Well, you don't. You have somebody else's database. So thinking about why folks would say the Jamstack is secure, it's because you yourself don't have a database to worry about. Therefore, you know, the ball's not in your court. You are secure. It's kind of a tough mindset to take on, and it's frustrating that that's why the Jamstack can be pitched as secure when it really is just somebody else's security problem. Um, sort of like, you know, it's 
if I say my money is secure, well, I, I really think it's secure because I put it in the bank down the road, but I don't actually have the money. I'm not really worried about the money security. I just chose to put my money in that bank. Um, you can think of it the same way for databases uh, with the Jamstack, but for the most part, you, you don't have a database with the Jamstack. Um, and so that, that is one reason why folks might say it's not, or why it is so secure. Um, another thing you have is, is you don't technically have a web server. You have a server that serves up the files that you ask for, but you don't have a server that's running scripts server side every time you request a file or a resource from the server, web server. Um, so that saves you from pretty much half of the top 10 vulnerabilities on that OWASP list. You don't have any broken authentication, broken access control, um, an attacker is not able to exploit XML external entities, which I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, there's no insecure deserialization attack. There's no insufficient logging and monitoring issues. Um, all in all, your, your bases are covered from the very pragmatic perspective that the Jamstack is just your static files and resources being served up on, you know, from a web server. And hence why folks will argue, again, that the Jamstack <laughs> is secure because you have such a reduced attack surface. Um, now I'll, I'll look at sort of debugging that or sort of debunking that theory by walking through uh, more details on the top 10. Do folks have any questions? I'll explain what all those like specific terms were as I go through these slides, but I just want to, I hope that I'm framing this correctly to, that it kind of makes sense what, a, what, what angle of approach we're taking. So I'll, I'll keep going right along. Uh, so injection uh, is something you might see as a vulnerability uh, described often in the context of SQL injection or database injection. And what this comes down to is when an application takes in data, and it's usually you know data that you want to trust, but in this instance, injection is when you take in untrusted data and the program just executes that data uh, as part of a command or a query, sort of blindly following it and possibly having negative ramifications. Um, an attacker will often come in and, and try to uh, exfiltrate data in this way or just clear your tables and things like that. And thankfully, since we don't have a database, we're not technically vulnerable to this. But again, any, any third party groups that are using databases that you're hooking into uh, through the Jamstack will have these kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, this, this comic I have up, if you can see it, it's, it's sort of a classic joke from uh, the folks at XKCD uh, about a kid, the, the woman's son named Bobby Tables. Uh, and, and what happens is, this is sort of a demonstrating injection in a funny way in that, you know, the school calls the mother and the mother said, well, all right, well, what's going on? Did something break? And, and the school says, you know, did you really name your son Robert uh, apostrophe parentheses semicolon drop table students? And, oh yes, little, little Bobby Tables, we call him that. And, uh, you know, the school says back, all right, well, we've, we've lost all this year's records. I hope you're happy. <laughs> and uh, the mom says in response, well, I hope you learn to sanitize your database inputs. And the reason this is a classic demonstration of injection is that, obviously, the mother came in. And see, if I explain the joke, it's not funny. You guys get it, you laugh. But I'll go ahead, I'll give an example of injection too, um, just to make it clear what we're talking about and how this can impact you, especially if you're a developer that is building with a Jamstack and also writing your own microservices. Um, in which case, all 10 of these vulnerabilities are in play. And again, the Jamstack is not as secure if, you, if you're using these technologies anyway. So it's just something to think about. Um, in this case, thinking about an injection example, uh, I want you to imagine that you're a machine on an assembly line, and you're told something in this form every time. It says, okay, fetch item number blank from section blank, off rack number blank, and place it on the conveyor belt. Okay, sounds good. So I'm this machine, I'm processing this command. An ideal command might be, oh, okay, fetch item number one, two, three, four, got it from section B2, got it, and take that from rack number 12. Okay, got it. And then place that on the conveyor belt. Makes sense what I'm getting at. So if I'm this robot executing these instructions and somebody wants to sort of perform an injection attack on my form, they might give me input like this. Fetch item number one, two, three, four, okay, got it. From section B2, okay, got it. From rack number 12, got it, and throw it out the window, then go back to your desk and ignore the rest of this form. Okay, so, you know, take the item, go back to my desk, and, and that's it. Don't place it on the conveyor belt. So by issuing the command to me in this way, this attacker has given me valid input. It, it fit the form. Um, cool, I can go in and execute it, and I, I get the item number, I got rack number 12, and 
Well, there's some extra instructions there, but I just execute it because there's no checks against this. There's no sanitation for my input. Um, and that's sort of a, a, another way to think of injection from a very non-technical perspective, um, but hopefully helps you to see why it matters. Um, so even though, again, I, I want to continue to frame this in the context of the Jamstack and, and let you form your own opinion about whether or not it's secure, the static site says, sure, you know, I'm not providing any input to my static site, right? I, I'm just going and, and getting some resources when I request pages from this site. Well, if your page, say, has a comment section powered by a Discus plugin, for example, and, and you go in and you want to request those comments, there might be more in those comments than just the HTML and the CSS that you think you're getting from that third party. Um, so it's something to think about. Another, so another popular vulnerability you find, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so then where is that going? It's going to a microservice or an API or something? Ideally. It's going somewhere else to a database. Right. So is the microservice inherently more secure than just the traditional? That's the debate. No. Is is it's so not it's it depends how it's implemented. If I if I wrote this microservice, it'd probably be garbage. It'd probably be like, oh, you know, injection flaws, whatever else, but maybe if I'm hooking in with you know, my buddy who writes really secure code and he's written this microservice for me, stood it up on AWS, um, then yeah, it might be more secure. But that's, I guess part of, yeah, that's, you've highlighted why it's, <laughs> why this is such already such a topic to discuss is how secure is the Jamstack even though it's got this reduced attack surface, if that makes sense. No, you're exactly. It's like you're exactly right. Section of your site that's compromised, rather than your forms, your whatever other microservices you're using. Yep, absolutely. I would I would argue yes, that's correct. If I'm using a, like a popular API OAuth as my authentication for my static site, and then I also or my Jamstack based site, and then I also have Discus comments plugged in. Well, okay, maybe not a great pairing, but stick with me. If the comment section's got a vulnerability, and I've got the right security policies on my web page then that vulnerability will stay constrained to where I've used that uh, microservice or third-party API on my site. The OAuth plugin will still sit on its own, and I can you know, trust the OAuth people, but cut Discus out of my life at that point. But you're exactly right that the, the attack vector is still sort of changed by using Jamstack than, uh, than it would be in a traditional setting, where it's all you know, WordPress, PHP plugins, all running the same language, all touching the same space. Um, so, so another thing uh, from that OWASP top 10, so number two, is cross-site scripting. Uh, you've probably heard of this too, and this is sort of similar to an injection. But here, the idea is not necessarily to run your malicious code on the server, but to have it sent back to another user of the site. Um, there's two main kinds. There's reflected cross-site scripting, XSS, and there's stored cross-site scripting. One involves just reflecting information back to your own browser to get information. The other, stored XSS, is when you try to take advantage of another user or get information from another user by storing some sort of malicious string and then having it run on their browser. Um, I've highlighted here that it does impact the Jamstack if your APIs are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Because again, if you're embedding these APIs, third-party software into your Jamstack site or application, it is touching and talking to the code on your site. Um, and I'll give a quick example, too, of cross-site scripting just so it makes sense in context. And uh, folks, if you've dabbled in this, you've probably seen it before. But if not, it's still still something that should make some decent sense. Um, so you mentioned having like a form on a site. Here I've got this search field on the corner of a site, and I search Jamstack. And you see on the output of my search, you know, I get could not find anything when searching for Jamstack. If you're thinking about this from a security perspective, you might say, oh, okay, well, if I search Jamstack, it outputs the string of exactly what I just searched. Now, if we're talking Jamstack, we've probably written a line of code in classic HTML before. So what happens if I put this as my search query? If I say, hmm, okay, search script alert, hello world, closing script, will it do could not find anything when searching for 
script alert hello world script or will it actually just go ahead and enter that tag and run that script? Well, the answer is if you search that string, you will on a very poorly put together website actually get that code to execute. Um, nowadays, this is this is one of the most popular vulnerabilities, so you won't see this a lot on. Like, I mean, you can go home and put that into your Facebook status, and it'll just post script, script alert, hello world, and and people will probably laugh at you if they know what you're trying to do. But um, but in all seriousness, this is something that you do find on a lot of sites that you might put together yourself, or, or you don't build in with that sort of security thought in mind. Um, so while this is pretty benign of an example, you could have this code. Um, the classic is if you have a really poorly written comment section. If I do embed this on my third party comments thing, let's say I cut off Discus and I go to um, you know, Tim's talk comment embed and I put this in on my, my website, uh, if, if some malicious party comes along and actually puts this in a comment, but maybe instead of hello world, they say, you know, your Tim's account has been closed, you're gonna have to send him $10, here's the information and pops that up instead, Great, not every user that goes to the comment section of my site is gonna see this pop-up that looks legitimate because they've stored their code in my database, the database of the uh, third-party API that I'm using, and that creates a problem for me. So it goes back to what uh, one of the folks mentioned before is that, well, yeah, technically now the attack surface has changed and in a sense reduced because it's more compartmentalized to the microservices that I'm taking advantage of. It's still a problem for me, um, even though it's thankfully not stored on my service or my site because you know the, the databases and the scripting code don't live on my, my Jamstack site anymore. They live in other people's servers and other people's sites. So another, it's another vulnerability to keep in mind. Um, another one, this is a sort of a quick one. Um, those are the only few examples that I have, but uh, another vulnerability on the top 10 is sensitive data exposure. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is where a security risk or an attacker can come in and take data from your system. You hear a lot about it in the context of these data breaches and cyber attacks. And I, I included this infographic of uh, how the how attackers exploited information from that Equifax attack. Do you guys hear about that? I think it was in the news. It's a um, it's a, one of the most I think most well-known examples of something like this, where attackers were mostly able to take advantage of our information being stored on Equifax's databases because it was just sitting there, it wasn't encrypted. There was no real work to be done to take it. No password cracking. Um, no need to sort of have somebody have somebody decrypt it, it was just there. So as long as I could take advantage of any vulnerability in the database, I was just able to take all the information that I wanted. Um, so this is something to think about, again, if you are using the Jamstack and using a third-party database, but also sensitive data exposure applies if you might commit, say, an API key to your Jamstack source. Uh, this is something I'll mention a couple more times as sort of a common practice that folks tend to accidentally fall into and then want to avoid. Um, but it absolutely applies here for this third sort of main vulnerability we see in web applications. Um, do you folks have any questions? I'm realizing I, this is going slower than I thought it would, so I'll speed it up a little unless, uh, unless anyone else wants me to slow down. <laughs> Um, so another thing we'll see um, in, in web app vulnerabilities is broken authentication. Uh, I include an article here about uh, sort of this Disney Plus hack that folks might have talked about when, this, when the platform first launched. This is a, like a streaming service competing with Netflix. Um, and folks were pretty upset. They thought their accounts were being hacked, their passwords were getting changed, and they thought, oh, you know, Disney Plus has this crazy vulnerability. Uh, well. In reality, Disney Plus just didn't have a strong authentication platform. So, so this vulnerability comes down to saying how strong your authentication is. Um, and the reason that their authentication was weak is because me, as a hacker, so let's say I took a bunch of usernames and passwords from some sensitive data exposure, and then I started plugging them into the Disney Plus login form. It, the fact that the Disney Plus login form just let me do that all day without something like a CAPTCHA or perhaps um, sort of limiting me based on my, my system, my IP address, some other metric, uh, it's safe to say that that's sort of a, a vulnerability in of itself. Um, this does impact the Jamstack if, again, you're using weaker APIs to implement your authentication. So it's something to think about beyond just, oh, you know, I'll put Auth0 on my Jamstack site and call it a day. You might want to take a closer look at how you have it configured and what sort of features that that third party provides to your Jamstack site. 
Um, because then at that point, how, how secure are you if I can steal Tim's password and then just plug it back into your site and, and do what's called credential stuffing against your application? Um, this is number four or five of the OWASP top 10, and that's a uh, broken access control. This is something that affects us as Jamstack developers when we're having perhaps protected routes on our site or if we want to restrict certain areas of our static site to different users. Um, the idea behind this being a vulnerability is it's any time that an unprivileged user might be able to perform privileged actions without verification. Uh, and it impacts the Jamstack if you're using weak authentication APIs. A quick example of this is if I'm, you know, going to visit the doctor and I confirm my appointment at the, some website, you know, hospital.com slash a patient slash account. Uh, if I get the information there, it says, great, your appointment is, you know, January 22nd. Um, that's good. But then I see, all right, well, that's good. There's no other links or pages on this site. That must be all that's there. Then I might go to the doctor and see on his screen, his or her screen, that there's hospital.com slash doctor slash account. And then I go home and I put that site into my, my web browser and I'm actually able to access it. This is a very, very, very like simple example of what I mean by a broken access control. Because now, okay, sure, even though my Jamstack Cider application didn't link me to hospital.com slash doctor slash account, that route, once I discovered it was there, it was completely accessible to me. There was no, uh, there was no checks or, or anything against whether Tim as a user was able to access that route. So something to think about within the context of your Jamstack applications and sites, especially if you're managing users or shopping carts and things like that. Um, this one is, is actually does not impact the Jamstack, but does impact your APIs. Essentially in XML external entities, Attack is when an application receives XML data. You can think of it as another way of sending data similar to JSON when we use an API. Um, and the same way that, um, the same way that you, well, I'll show you in a second. But um, when you receive XML, it can be malicious XML that will hurt your web server or your website if it's not properly configured. So this impacts a lot of existing web architecture, but we won't really encounter this in the Jamstack and even in a lot of APIs as we move towards a more JSON-centric HTTP post-put uh, kind of request model. Um, what it does play down to, though, is insecure deserialization. Uh, this is when if I send data um, through a stream of, of bytes or some other binary or compressed file format, um, if I stream that to my API or my site and I deserialize that and there's some malicious code in there because, I, again, I'm trusting the deserialization. If I deserialize that and there's something malicious there, well, that's another vulnerability that I could be impacted by. Since we're not deserializing anything in the Jamstack, we're just asking for files and getting files, it doesn't impact us, but same, same thing. <laughs> Depending on the APIs you're using, uh, this can impact you, even if you have a simple file upload feature on your Jamstack site. Um, this one is, an, is a fun sort of vulnerability to think about because it isn't really a code technical vulnerability in itself. Rather, it is focused on sort of a question that was asked earlier. Okay, well, if we didn't get that pop-up on the screen that this was malicious, how would we know? We wouldn't. <laughs> um, and so insufficient logging and monitoring is considered another OWASP top 10 vulnerability because if, if credential, you know, if folks are going to our Disney Plus site and trying to stick all kinds of logins into our site and they're just all failing, if I don't see that on my end as a log entry or something, some sort of event in an event monitoring system, how would I even know that it's happening? Um, and again, this isn't something that impacts you on the Jamstack, thankfully, but again, if you're including any sort of third-party API, login, file upload, shopping carts, you, you're gonna wanna have that as an option to look at what your website is being used for and if you're protected. Uh, I like to think of it as sort of the check engine light vulnerability. You, you wouldn't know anything's wrong with your engine until your car stops or if something told you ahead of time. Um, this is also, it's, so these are still, still OWASP top 10. Uh, using components with known vulnerabilities, this kind of alludes to sort of the little anecdote I gave in the beginning, but it directly impacts your use of the Jamstack. Uh, this is the first one that you can say that because if you're using source code, components, modules, or packages that have existing vulnerabilities or code that can be compromised and that's been publicized, you, your web application is vulnerable. Um, continuing along with the, yeah, okay, so this is the last OWASP vulnerability, and then Lucas, I'll take your question. What's up?
It's okay. <laughs> so the packages, do you think that also runs a risk if you're continuously updating the packages and, and, and seeing the quantity yeah. of Yeah, I'd say so. runs a risk of potentially breaking your site as well and creating yourself more bugs. Mm -hmm. No, I, <laughs> you've been heard. Don't worry. <laughs> but um, so I, I get into this. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> On the, on kind of the, the I'll, I'll get to it in a sec, but yes, I have a point that touches on, on that. So you're one step ahead of me, which is, which is good. Like I'm, I'm excited just to hear you're thinking about the security in the context of your web apps. Um, and so quick note on security misconfiguration is this is the other vulnerability that directly impacts you on the Jamstack. Um, because again, as we talked about like 60 times now, and I really just want to drive that point home is, is you're often going to require third party code and APIs to add engaging experiences to your Jamstack site. So you want to make sure that you have the right configurations in place to allow that code to safely exist on your site in sort of a sandbox. Um, and a lot of that comes with starting out with just providing HTTPS, which is almost a requirement now for having a site or an application on the web. But going further to specify some different features of your site that um, will, will allow that third party code to coexist, like I was saying. Um, so an example, a quick example of a security misconfiguration and why that might be an issue and, and a sort of fun fact, like why do I need HTTPS or hypertext transfer protocol secure socket layer, uh, which is just a secure TLS secure version of HTTP. Um, what it really does for you is give users the integrity that your site is your site and that the content you're delivering as your website um, is truly what you say it is. Uh, the code, the, the transmission of this site to your system or your computer is, is encrypted. And so by having this HTTPS encryption, um, you know that this information hasn't been tampered with or interfered with. If you're not using HTTPS, a classic thing, you know, folks say don't, don't do your banking on a public Wi-Fi network or something like that, or, you know, don't, don't send anything you wouldn't show your mom on a coffee shop network, whatever. If you go and connect to what you think is, you know, Starbucks Wi-Fi, that could actually be someone trying to perform a classic man-in-the-middle attack where that's not really the Starbucks Wi-Fi. That might be me on my laptop creating an access point saying Starbucks Wi-Fi. But when you connect to my system, I'm actually intercepting all the traffic you're trying to send to the internet. And I might be modifying it. I might be showing you something different than what you're going to see. Um, and even possibly confusing you and just not even touching your request, just forwarding it along, saying, oh, cool, he's going to bankofamerica.com. Let me just let him log in, send that back. And then he says, oh, OK, $10,000 transfer to this account. Let me just modify this and put in my routing number. And then I'll let that go through. Um, HTTPS gives you some comfort on that because this kind of attack is not going to be easily executable at all without that sort of security in mind um, versus with HTTP, I can tell you, sure, I'm this site, I'm this content, this hasn't been modified, who cares? It's all unencrypted happening over the network. Um, so that's sort of another thing to consider with the Jamstack because it, well, you know, if, if it's HTTP uh, Tim's Jamstack site .com and versus an HTTPS version, one of those is, is easily spoofed um, in, in a variety of settings, not just on your fake coffee shop Wi-Fi. So talking, I've talked through, sorry, kind of quick at the end, but I walked through all the, the 10 vulnerabilities you'll see on web applications and how they apply to the Jamstack. Um, I'll walk through, these are just three slides with some bullet points about um, what you will want to do to secure your Jamstack site in the beginning and hopefully give you some points of inspiration for kind of taking this research out on your own. Um, any questions up to this point? Otherwise, I'll take this one home and, and folks can go home. So, <laughs> Just quickly, yeah. did I hear you say that Disney set up their, uh, their Disney Plus site so you could brute force the password? Uh, originally, yeah. It's I, from what I saw is there was no rate limiting or any sort of checks and that folks were able to, again, why folks were thinking they were hacked is really hackers said, oh, sweet, I got this database of emails and passwords from the Yahoo hack. Let me see if they didn't change their password, which is a, a classic story for why you shouldn't use the same password on every website and service because somebody probably has one of them. Um, and then when there's an opportunity to do something like, oh, sweet, this new service is launching everybody's making new accounts and they just want to get on there, they're going to reuse their Netflix password, their Yahoo password, their Equifax password, you name it. So. And I know you can't really answer this, but they don't. It just seems like something that Disney should be looking out for. Like, I might not worry about 
Yeah. Getting brute forced, but you would think that. You would think that it's. Know, you know. This is all just that. That's. <laughs> Right. And it's across all of their apps. Because like, it's not just, it is just, it's Disney Plus, but it's also like what you use to manage yeah, your theme park the thing and all that, parks, yeah? Cruise line, so like it's not just Disney Plus, it was the fact that it, the fact that their single sign on, like identity provider, did not have any security <laughs> authentication in place. Yeah. Any, yeah. Benefits of the jam stack. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, don't roll your own authentication. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't roll your own authentication. Don't try to write your own encryption algorithms. It's, it's a, um, it's certainly, it's it's like part of the value in interesting like third party code is is part of it's like okay well, what if I don't want to trust it? But then also sometimes it's worth the risk of having that that much shorter lead time to roll something out that might actually be more secure. Um, but either way, I'll walk through sort of three slides of my sort of entry level tips as to how you might begin to secure your Jamstack site. In reality, this is going to be so purpose-based for what your site is. If I'm an online marketplace, if it's a photo blog, if it's something that I'm using to share photos with my friends and family, uh, there's, there's so many different angles to approach this, and I, I just want to hopefully give you the tools to kind of start thinking about it for your own use case. Um, so I'll frame this in the context of the kind of very simple development cycle for the Jamstack. You know, a developer writes the code generate my bundles of, of nice static files, I'll upload it to my CDN or, or other service, or I'll have a, something do that for me, like you see again on Netfl Netlify and things like this. Um, and then when a user goes to access the site, those static files are served up, and then at that point, the user's computer is accessing whatever APIs or third-party platforms that I've included in my site. Um, so there's those three steps. There's where the developer writes the code, there's where the CDN serves the files, and then there's where the user accesses the site's uh, services. So when you're writing your code, just some things to think about, and Lucas, this goes back to what you were saying earlier too, is, is you want to remove things like unused dependencies, unnecessary features, and any old components and files because those can sit there and maybe continue to get updated as you continue to build out the rest of your application and become vulnerable without you even paying attention to it. Um, that's why it's important to take advantage or take inventory of your library versions and, and keep your packages up to date. But you might want to consider using a package lock and updating the packages yourself from time to time so that some new update on a package you really like doesn't just roll in automatically with vulnerable code. Um, there's great things out there like uh, NPM audit and then also GitHub security tools are really nice. If you have a GitHub repo, that's uh, in a language or a format that GitHub has sort of written its security tooling for. It'll tell you, and even, I think it does automatic pull requests now to update packages that have been vulnerable, no, labeled as vulnerable, but a patch has been issued, or vice versa. If the code has become vulnerable and there's no patch issued, you have options to downgrade, upgrade, or remove those packages right from inside the GitHub uh, repo management, which is really useful. Um, and something else to think about in my example earlier is that that was an official source, but there's some quick reading you can do if you Google around for the, like some of the key terms I mentioned earlier, uh, where it, you can put you can throw your own npm package out there and have it be made available, not have it on GitHub, not have the source available, and folks can still use it and potentially compromise their you know their excuse me their platform and their code and things like this. Um, I won't spoil it too much, but if you get a chance to read that article I mentioned earlier, it should be pretty interesting. Um, when you're configuring your server, I mentioned HTTPS before. You also want to look at uh, using some secure HTTP response headers. I won't get too much into what those are right now for the sake of time, but um, you can check out these slides afterwards too. I've got a link, and you might want to read more about implementing things like a content security policy and uh, HTTP strict transport security headers. These two things allow your web browser to work with you to say, okay, well, I've served up these static files. I'm well aware that these static files are about to talk to some other websites, APIs, platforms. Can you please sort of follow this policy, follow these rules when you're accessing these sites to keep me secure? Um, and that's very helpful when you've got these thir this third-party code, uh, you know, comments box, whatever. And that helps me to actually say, hey, like, if I have, you know, uh, content from cdn.discus.com and I'm bringing comments into my site, don't 
don't let discus.com go hit hackertim.com. Keep the code just to discus.com. Um, so that's really obviously beneficial if you do have compromised code ending up in your site. Uh, finally, something to think about and sort of what I've touched on throughout is when you're using APIs and other third-party code, really think about the permissions you've given that code. Think about setting and configuring those permissions the right way. Um, don't store access tokens, API keys, or passwords in the code that you're committing to those static files because they're still readily available. Um, you want to establish some level of trust with the APIs and third-party code that you do bring in. Um, and if you're writing your own API, right, good luck to you. Like, there's a lot of reading out there, um, and it's important to have, just like what we were talking about, like thinking about when the right time to rule your own implementation is and when it's not. Um, so yeah, coming back to it, thinking about our attack surface, what we really have now is the same entry point, the same attack surface, but if you secure it the right way, you can have that nice secure vault on the right, or you can have the cheap padlock on your one door into your Jamstack site. So I hope that you think about ways to keep yours looking more like this and not so much like this. Um, and check out the slides and a variety of links and content uh, there. And, and thank you for sitting here through my first Jamstack talk. I appreciate it. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? If Yes. Right. I'd say, yeah, I'd say because that's that slash admin to get to the admin panel is, is classic. I, I believe it falls into one of these categories too, uh, like security misconfiguration. It's, it comes down to, all right, well, slash admin's available. The fact that that's there, maybe I should have configured that route to be different. The advantage that Jamstack has is, is pretty much exactly what you said. I'd say it's worth the, if, if you're asking sort of like, uh, how big of a deal is it that it's like that? I'd say it's it's a contributing factor to what does make it the argument for the Jamstack being secure, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, if you have any other questions, timtheguy.com, send me an email. Uh, otherwise, thank you guys so much for, for sharing this with me. I hope, that, hope it was eye-opening and, and helpful.